up today, South Korea announces the location for the US anti-missile system known as THAAD. Seoul says the system will counter North Korea's growing nuclear and missile threats. South Korea's central bank will announce its decision on interest rates in the coming hours. It also plans to unveil its new growth outlook and inflation projections. First, Theresa May has taken over as Britain's new Prime Minister. She says Britain will forge a bold new role for itself outside of the European Union. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Thursday, July 14th here in Seoul. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, South Korea has revealed the location of the soon-to-be-deployed U.S. anti-missile defense system known as Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD. It is going to be placed in Songju County in the south of the country. Seoul and Washington say the system will better protect South Korea against North Korea's growing missile threats. Our Kim Hyun-bin starts us off. South Korea's defense ministry announced on Wednesday that the THAAD battery will be deployed to Songju County, Gyeongsangbuk-do province. South Korea and the U.S. have decided to deploy THAAD to the Songju area. The installation will protect up to half of our citizens from North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile threats, in addition to protecting key facilities. South Korea and the U.S. agreed last Friday to place THAAD in South Korea to counter North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities and is scheduled to be deployed before the end of 2017. The Allies said they picked Songju because it is in a mountainous region that is sparsely populated and it already has an air defense artillery unit. According to military officials, the THAAD battery in Songju will place the main U.S. military bases in Pyeongtaek and Taegu within its operational range, which will reach as far as Kerongde, Chungcheongnam-do province, where South Korea's military headquarters is located. The port city of Busan and the surrounding southern cities will also be included in its range. That only has a range of 200 kilometers, so it will not be able to cover Seoul. However, South Korea's defense ministry says that most of the ballistic missiles targeting the capital are Scud missiles that fly at an altitude of less than 40 kilometers, and that that is only able to intercept missiles that can fly at higher than 40 kilometers. South Korea currently has Pac-2 and Pac-3 Patriot missiles in Seoul to counter North Korea's ballistic missiles. These Pac series missiles are low tier interceptors that can intercept incoming missiles at an altitude range from 3 to 23 kilometers. Military officials say that when an incoming enemy missile is detected, two Patriot missiles are fired simultaneously to intercept it, with a success rate of 90 percent. Kim Hyun bin, Arirang News. Now, South Korea's main political parties remain divided over the decision to deploy the THAAD system here. The ruling party sides with the government on the inherent need for THAAD to protect the country, but the main and minor opposition parties are either unsure or dead against it. Ji Myung Gil reports. The ruling's Henry party said the deployment of the advanced U.S. missile defense system was inevitable to protect the country from North Korea's missile threats. It also urged the opposition parties to cooperate in supporting the move. The THAAD deployment is in South Korea's interest and security. The rival parties should cooperate. If North Korea ends its nuclear and missile provocations, then we can pull out of the THAAD deployment. The floor leader also called on the local governments in the deployment area to manage the strong regional opposition to the plan. The main opposition Minju Party of Korea said it would launch a THAAD committee within the party to discuss the issue. We must come up with detailed countermeasures concerning the diplomatic and economic problems stemming from the THAAD deployment. Our party has decided to form a THAAD committee with our floor leader Woo Sang-ho leading it. Former party chair Moon Jae-in also called on the government to gather public opinion on the issue and urged it to seek parliamentary approval for the deployment plan. 
The minor opposition People's Party questioned why the government went ahead with the Thai deployment, given the potential for diplomatic fallout with China and Russia. We've heard that South Korea's foreign affairs minister was against the THAAD deployment due to the possible diplomatic friction with neighboring countries. It is also likely that the U.S. could have pressured the presidential office of Chong Wade. The interim leader also urged the presidential office to reverse its unilateral decision to deploy the U.S. missile defense system to South Korea. The opposition parties pressured the government to properly address the social, economic and diplomatic issues stemming from the deployment plan. Kim young Arirang News. Now, in other news, North Korea appears to be making progress in its submarine-launched ballistic missile development, and leader Kim Jong-un seems determined to make it a success. This is according to Joseph Bermudez co-founder and chief analytic officer of All Source Analysis. Speaking at a briefing organized by North Korea monitoring site 38 North, Bermudez said North Korea seems to be taking steps forward with each test and predicted that at this rate, the regime will attempt or will succeed at a full range test sometime in the next 12 months. He said the biggest challenges facing the North's SLBM development are quality control and system integration. If and when completed, Bermudez warned Pyongyang's SLBM capabilities would pose significant threats as they could be launched from different locations. The Bank of Korea will set the key interest rate later on this Thursday. The central bank will also unveil its new outlook for the Korean economy and give a briefing on consumer price growth. For a sneak peek of what's to come, Hwang Jie reports. After a surprise rate cut in June, the market consensus for this month is Korea's central bank will hold its current 1.25 percent key interest rate steady. As the Bank of Korea gears up for a monetary policy meeting scheduled for Thursday, analysts highlight the fact that it has never lowered the key rate for two straight months. They add the BOK will want to take time to gauge the impact of a government stimulus package announced late last month. But when looking through to the end of the year, many have expectations for another rate trim. While the country's main growth engine exports have dropped for a year and a half, experts say several uncertainties, including Britain's decision to leave the European Union, continue to threaten the country's growth. The global contraction of the trade uh, after the Brexit vote especially is likely to uh, negatively affect the global trade, which we think will drop the export further in the second half of this year. And with major economies like Japan gearing up for more monetary easing in the wake of the incident, experts say it's unlikely that Korea will keep its own rate unchanged. After the Brexit, countries worldwide are heading to implement monetary easing policies like quantitative easing and lowering key rates. And that means the BOK has room to also jump into that race. Experts add a separate briefing the BOK governor will hold on the country's low inflation rate could push up expectations for more rate cuts down the road. As for the bank's latest growth outlook for Korea this year, a majority of economists expect the BOK to revise the figure down to 2.6 percent. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. South Korea and Switzerland have put pen to paper on deals aimed at boosting their Creative Economy Partnership. During summit talks on Wednesday evening at the presidential office of Chong Wade, President Park Geun-hye and her Swiss counterpart Johan schneider Amann agreed to expand cooperation in ICT, biohealth and job training. The two sides plan to pay special attention to expanding people-to-people -people exchanges for joint research projects in big data and cloud computing and the development of new medicines. Seoul and Geneva had earlier set the base for further cooperation in basic science and ICT during President Park's visit to Switzerland in 2014. Theresa May has taken over as Britain's new Prime Minister, heading straight to 10 Downing Street after meeting Queen Elizabeth at Buckingham Palace. The 59-year-old is Britain's second female Prime Minister and replaces David Cameron, who stepped down after losing the referendum on Britain's EU membership. In her inaugural remarks as PM, May said Britain will rise to the challenges it faces and forge a 
bold new role as it leaves the European Union. May also vow to lead a one-nation government that works for all and not just the privileged few. She said it would be her mission to build a better Britain. In a bold move, Theresa May immediately appointed leave campaigner Boris Johnson as her foreign secretary. She sacked Finance Minister George Osborne, replacing him uh, with that man there, Philip Hammond. May also named David Davis the Secretary of State for exiting the EU. Liam Fox has a new role as Secretary of State for International Trade, a key position as Britain looks to forge a slew of new trade deals. Today, July 14th, is a very special day for Adirang TV, the channel you're watching right now. Exactly one year ago, we became the first Korean broadcaster to be included on the UN's in-house network. This means Adirang TV is broadcast at UN headquarters with international news channels like BBC World, Al Jazeera and CNN International. I'll park you on reports from New York. This is the United Nations headquarters in New York, where hundreds of UN officials and tourists busily come and go every day. And in the one corner of the lobby near the front gate, there's a screen attached on the wall, and look, it's broadcasting Arirang TV. It's been a year since Korea's global broadcaster that reaches over 120 million households worldwide was designated as one of the UN headquarters in-house network channels. UN officials can watch these in-house channels while they work at their desks. As you can see here, each desk is equipped with a monitor showing the UN's in-house network channels, including Arirang TV. Under the channel name Korea Arirang, Arirang TV is one of only 19 UN in-house channels, along with international broadcasters like CNN and BBC World and major American news networks like NBC and ABC. The UN's Under Secretary General Christina Gallag explains that Arirang TV brings greater regional diversity to the UN's lineup of channels. It is very important that uh, the channels that are broadcasted internally do represent the key actors in the international community, different regions in the world, and help to open us to new different cultures and um, economic and social issues. Veteran journalist Gian Paolo Pioli, who has been covering the UN for the past 31 years as a resident correspondent, says he sometimes gets help from Arirang TV. I used to have my screen at the UN split on four uh, with the internal uh, television, and one of the four channels is Arirang. Why? Well, because I need a uh, different point of view, especially if I follow a story about North Korea or South Korea, I consider uh, your channel. The ambassador and permanent representative of South Korea to the United Nations hopes Arirang TV keeps playing an important role at the UN. As Arirang TV can be viewed by diverse UN member states and the employees of the UN Secretariat, I hope the channel makes the most of the opportunity and maintains the quality of its content. Arirang TV will be on the UN's in-house network channel for five years. And the partnership will be reviewed when deciding to renew the contract or not. So now it's up to Arirang TV to provide more up-to-date global news and content to ensure it remains one of the UN's go-to channels for decades to come. Park Ji-won, Arirang News, New York. Now, the countdown to the 2016 Olympics is on. And in the Korean national team going to Rio next month, there are athletes with a number of Olympic appearances under their belt. Uh, Gwon jang -ho met with one sporting veteran, Oh Young-ran, who is uh, one of women's handball team. Uh, she made her Olympic debut in the 1996 Atlanta Games. Forever the Moment immortalized the feats of Korea's women's handball team at the 2004 Athens Olympics, where the underdogs reached the finals only to lose to Denmark in a heartbreaking penalty shootout. Winger Woo Sun and goalkeeper Oh Young-ran were part of that team. 
Now, 12 years later, they'll be representing Korea again, trying to make up for the pain of that loss. It's an honor to be able to go to the Olympics at my age, and I really want to win that gold medal. It's the final ambition of my handball career. In 2004, Orr was already the second oldest player on the team at 32. Now she's 44, a mother of two, and the oldest woman in the entire Korean Olympic delegation. I thought it was a joke at first when the coaches said, you should join the Olympic team. I was like, what are you talking about? I retired from the national team eight years ago. But then I got the call from manager Im and it all happened. Manager Im yong chol who was also there in 2004, was the one who convinced Or to return after seeing a need for some older, experienced heads. There are things such as lifestyle, attitude toward training, sense of duty as a member of the national team. Without the older players' experience, it was a mess. It's better for the veterans to show them, rather than have me tell them. Yu so Jung is the youngest member of the team. At age 20, she's 24 years younger than Oh. But any worries about team bonding quickly dissipated as Oh embraced the role of mentor. She approaches me first and makes it easy for me to open up to her, and she doesn't make me feel the age gap. It feels like the older players are taking the pressure off me. Oh and Woo are not simply there for show. They're both coming off impressive seasons in the Korean Handball League. For example, Oh has a save percentage of almost 39%, the third highest in the league. To not have picked them just because of their age would have been wrong. I picked them because they were playing well, and I believe it was the right thing to do. As Oh and Woo look to defy the limits of age, many will agree they can already be proud of getting this far. But as athletes, their goal will be to get their team to the top of that podium. Kwon jang Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a great day. Goodbye.